This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and today is Saturday, and that means it's time for another edition of Nitsa Notes, my weekly vlog series where I talk about limited magic. Right now, where we're sort of between limited formats, you know, we're between uh, Streets of New Capenna and Alchemy Horizons uh, Baldur's Gate. Uh, so we're kind of in this, you know, no man's land of limited where we've talked a lot about the set that's out now, and there's not a whole lot to talk about with the next set just yet. Uh, so we've been doing some broader topics uh, lately, uh, and we're doing another one today. I wanted to look at the 10 best commons uh, that we've ever had, and I do mean obviously for limited, because this series covers that. And I was inspired to do this because of Inspiring Overseer, a common in Streets of New Capenna that people, I've had people ask me, um, you know, how good of a common is this compared to all the commons ever? Uh, and the answer is pretty good. Um, and you'll see whether or not it makes my top 10 list of the best commons ever. Uh, but there are some really crazy powerful ones and there are a lot that are stronger than Inspiring Overseer for sure. Uh, so let's jump into our list uh, of the 10 best limited commons we've ever seen. These are the most powerful commons we've ever had in a limited format. Obviously, you know, this isn't based entirely, it can't be based on data, really. Um, you know, maybe if we had 17 lands way back in the day, I'd have some data, uh, but we didn't. So I don't have any data. It's just sort of based on how powerful these cards were in their respective limited formats. Um, you know, it's based on the data of me playing with the cards generally, um, but you know, can't go much beyond that. But I do think these are the 10 best commons uh, we've ever had in a limited format. So let's go ahead and jump right in. At number 10, I have a recent card. It's Sorolf's Packmate. Uh, so yeah, pretty new card and pretty simple too. It's a four mana three, three that draws you a card when it enters a battlefield. But, and that would be a pretty good card anyway, but what I think makes Sorolf's Packmate really good uh, is the fact that it has Foretell. And, you know, being able to cast this on turn three for two mana is a huge deal. You know, paying it in installments makes it way more powerful. This card was virtually always a two for one, kind of like Inspiring Overseer is. Uh, and it was a very, very strong common, one you would take over most of the rares and mythics uh, in Kaldheim. Uh, it was a pretty easy pick. Uh, very powerful. Foretell really powers this card up. And speaking of Inspiring Overseer, at number nine, that's the card that I have. This three mana two one that draws you a card and gains you one life and has flying has been an incredibly good common. You take it almost over almost all the rares and mythics in the set. Um, it's, you know, sort of emblematic of some of the things that are wrong with this format, namely that they made this monocolored card better than a lot of the uncommons are that are monocolored common, better than a lot of multicolored uncommons in the set. And that's part of why this set sort of uh, fell flat in terms of really being a set that's interested in three color, like legitimate three color decks because of a card like Inspiring Overseer. But yeah, I mean, it's very strong. Uh, it also combos well with stuff going on in the format. In particular, you can put counters on it to make it into an actual threat. And that has been really great. At number eight, I have Wild Mongrel. This two mana two two has so much upside. You know, you can discard a card, you give it plus one plus one until end of turn. That in itself is a pretty powerful card and would be and has been in any limited format. I mean, the threat of activation is important. Your opponent can't block in a lot of situations if you have cards in your hand. But I think in a regular format, Wild Mongrel wouldn't make this list, but Odyssey and Odyssey Block more broadly had two graveyard mechanics that were central, um, Threshold and Madness. I mean, I guess Madness isn't a graveyard mechanic, but it involves putting a card into your graveyard and still getting to cast it. And the Wild Mongrel can set up both of those in addition to being what was a hugely efficient creature at the time that was very difficult to block if your opponent had any cards in their hand at all. And if they're discarding something to, you know, say, you block with your uh three three and they can discard like a land and a card with madness to pump the mongrel to kill the thing that's blocking um and then they cast one of the cards they discarded that had madness 
um, you're not coming back from that. I mean, that is very, very difficult to overcome. So you just can't block it mostly and it gets in for damage. And then eventually things reach a point where you can't just take it because your opponent has cards in their hand that they can turn into lethal. It allowed you to cast those madness spells at instant speed. It just really tied together the whole format and the, the format's mechanics. And it did it at common with a card that would be good in any limited format, but was extra good in this one because of madness and threshold. At number seven, I have Spike Shot Goblin. This is a card that doesn't look, I mean, it would be good today, a three mana one, two that you can pay one red and tap to do one damage to anything. You'd play that all the time, um, but it probably on the surface doesn't exactly look like a card that would be on a list like this, you know, if that's all it was doing, but it usually does a lot more than that. And that's sort of a continuing theme we're going to see as we move up the list now, is that these are all cards that have some sort of repeatable effect, or at least almost all of them are, that you can get over and over again to gain a really significant advantage. And Spike Shot Goblin is one of those. Um, I, in a base level, it can ping things, but the damage it does is actually equal to its power, and Mirrodin, and Mirrodin block more broadly, had a ton of common equipment, the most notable of which were Bone Splitter and Leonin Scimitar, but there was other common equipment around too, and if you could put it on this goblin and you started paying one red to do two or three to things, things got out of hand, and it wasn't that hard to do, just because they put so much good equipment at common. This was Mirrodin was actually the very first set with equipment. Um, we very rarely these days see equipment as efficient as Bone Splitter at Common these days. Um, and, you know, that's what really allowed things to combo with the Sharpshooter, or not Sharpshooter, Spike Shot Goblin. That's what it is. Sharpshooter's a rare card. Hopefully I've said Spike Shot Goblin this whole time. Anyway, but the Goblin, yeah, you can pay one red mana, tap it, does damage to things, and it was very easy to augment its power so you could get ridiculous value out of the ability, uh, and it would just take over games. If, if there was a Bone Splitter on a Spike Shot Goblin, which was a common sight in the format, you didn't have a very good chance of beating your opponent, especially if you didn't remove it almost immediately. But generally, they're gonna get some value out of it, and then when you do kill it, you're kind of getting two for one, um, and that's not very much fun. So yeah, Spike Shot Goblin was a real beating in Mirrodin. Next up, it's Triplicate Spirits. Uh, so, you know, six mana to get three 1-1 one, one flyers isn't very good, but when you throw Convoke in the mix, Triplicate Spirits ends up being really absurd. Uh, you end up being able to cast it for a lot less mana. It gives you three bodies. It's a common, so you can actually sometimes chain them together with other Triplicate Spirits. Um, you know, the white decks in M15 also had, you know, lots of nice ways to go wide. And getting these three tokens in the air, I mean, you know, it's not quite Lingering Souls or something like that, right? But it feels kind of close to Lingering Souls in some games, in many games, really. Um, you know, the Lingering Souls doesn't need to set up Triplicate Spirits does to make a bunch of bodies, but Triplicate Spirits setup was sort of easy to achieve uh, in M15, and you would end up getting these three bodies for like three mana, and uh, that felt really absurd, um, and they would really take over the game from there, you know, Creating a bunch of flying tokens tends to be a pretty good way to win a game of limited in pretty much any format, and that was true here too, and they allowed you to do it with a common. At number five, I have Sparksmith. This is yet another goblin that can tap and damage things. It can't hit opponents, of course, but uh, it can do a lot of damage. It's kind of like Spike Shot Goblin in that there's some setup uh, for it to really do its thing, but, you know, goblins were one of the main supported tribes in Onslaught block. So the Sparksmith's ability to tap and kill things, basically it ends up feeling like it says tap, destroy target creature, and you can do it multiple times across the course of a game. And yes, you do get damaged. You know, um, you end up, it, you know, if you ended up in a deck with a lot of goblins, Sparksmith could end up hurting you, but the fact it could just clear out almost any blocker and allow you to swing out every turn made it not matter that much uh, when you could just spike uh, Sparksmith things uh, in the face over and over again, um, you know, it didn't matter that you were taking damage because your opponent could never keep a creature in play. So this is a repeatable removal spell at common, uh, which was really, really heinous in the format and really warped it uh, around Sparksmith and just how powerful it was. At number four, I've got Capsize. Here's another card that has a repeatable effect thanks to buyback. Um, it lets you return any permanent to its owner's hand for three mana. Um, that includes lands, by the way. Uh, that would be a nice card in most limited formats. Um, but 
Tempest was a very slow slog of a limited format, and there would be games where it was very easy for you to capsize and buy back twice on your opponent, the end of your opponent's turn, and you just keep generating that value every turn. You'd have that much mana and that much time to do it, that ultimately you could use capsize to put your opponent uh, way too far behind on the board, really gain control of the game. And it was a card at common that was really like a one card value engine, thanks to, <laughs> thanks to buyback, which is pretty absurd. Um, you know, you can sort of look at it as every turn you can pay six mana to return a permanent to its owner's hand. And, you know, that would be a really good card. And that's effectively what we have here, except it has the upside of if you can't buy it back and you just need to fire it off, you can. Um, so Capsize ended up just devastating um, a lot of decks in the format. And it was another card like Sparksmith that could have a tendency to make the format feel not very fun uh, because there were a lot of them to go around. A lot of people were playing Temp or capsize in Tempest, and um, it felt a lot of the time like whoever got capsized first just wins because they can really gain control of the board, open up the board so they can attack more effectively, and they can do it all at instant speed, uh, which was a huge problem too. And number three, I have Rolling Thunder. So you might be more familiar with this card from its more recent reprint in Battle for Zendikar, and when it was reprinted then, it was at Uncommon, thank goodness, because back in Tempest, it was a common, along with Capsize. Uh, so it's another common that was more powerful, like Capsize, more powerful than most of the rares and mythics, or there weren't mythics, but the rares that were in the set. It was just incredibly strong. Um, and as I said about Capsize, the format tended to be pretty slow, so, uh, you know, Rolling Thunder, casting it where X equals seven, destroying three creatures uh, was not really a stretch in the format. Um, you know, you could really devastate the opponent um, either by, you know, spreading out the damage to kill a bunch of their creatures. And then it can also just go to their face for lethal. So it was way too powerful of a card that had way too big of an impact on the format. Um, and, you know, if you have pack one, pick one, Rolling Thunder versus Capsize, that's the reason I have Rolling Thunder higher, because I think I would take Rolling Thunder over Capsize. It may not be a repeatable effect, but it's a far more powerful effect, like in a vacuum. And, um, you know, it really reshapes the board in a way that Capsize can only do over the course of several turns. Uh, so, yeah. Thank goodness they made it uncommon in Battle for Zendikar because it was still an insanely good card there, <laughs> just like it was in Tempest, but people had fewer of them, so it didn't feel quite as much of a problem. All right, the second best uncommon for limited of all time, I think, is Pestilence. Um, this is an enchantment, another one with a repeatable effect. This is an enchantment where you can pay one black to do one damage to everything, all creatures and all players. Um, so it's basically a board sweeper that is very customizable that you can use over and over again. You know, there does have to be a creature in play or it goes away, um, but because you control Pestilence, you can really decide when to use it. Sometimes you do just want to wipe the board with it. It can also do lethal to your opponent out of nowhere, um, but other times you can just use it to clear out a few blockers and open up the table for attacks from you. Um, it just took over games. I mean, this being a common, obviously these are all nuts being commons, but like, we wouldn't bat an eye today if Pestilence was printed at Mythic Rare, like both between power level and how sort of uh, unique it is. Um, it would be like, wow, that's a really good Mythic Rare, and it would probably be a bomb because it's, again, kind of a customizable and repeatable Wrath effect that can also burn out your opponent. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that that just can't be at common in a limited format, but it was back in Urza Saga, uh, and that is pretty insane. And at number one, ahead of all these things, the best common for limited ever, I think, is Sprout Swarm. It combines a couple of the things we've already seen. Uh, for one thing, it is a repeatable effect because of buyback, and for another, it has Convoke, and the Convoke combos well with itself, which matters even more here than it does with Triplicate Spirits because you only need one copy of Sprout Swarm to start going off with it. Um, you know, two mana to make a 1-1 Sapperling, not great. Neither is paying five for a 1-1 Sapperling, which is what you have to do if you want to buy it back. However, um, you just end up generating uh, so many tokens with this at instant speed, um, and you can just keep doing it over and over. I mean, in a worst case scenario, you can keep making a 1-1 to chump block your opponent's problematic attacker, and eventually the value that you generate from Sprout Swarm will allow you to start just casting it multiple times every turn like you can with Capsize, only this actually adds to the board in a more permanent way. Like, it gives you 
Um, not quite a card worth of value. A 1 1 Sapperling's probably not quite there, but it's pretty close. Uh, and yeah, it combos with itself because once you start making a bunch of Sapperlings with it, you can start tapping them so that you get buyback. You can pay the buyback with Convoke, you can pay for the card with Convoke. And so you end up not paying any mana for it at some point and generating multiple of these tokens a turn. And the format had plenty of other cards around that you could use to convoke. You know, you could go wide and really uh, use Sprout Swarm just over and over and over again. Um, it's another card that's a one card value engine at common that just does its thing all on its own, sort of like Capsize does. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just took over games. I think it's the best limited common ever. I mean, you know, um, it's interesting because I think Pestilence feels more like it would be a higher rarity than Sprout Swarm maybe does, but I still think Sprout Swarm could take over games more effectively in more situations than even Pestilence could, even though Pestilence is also insane. I could definitely see swapping those two at the top of the list, but um, Sprout Swarm is, is uh, an incredibly powerful common, one that really warped uh, the Future Sight limited format around it. So those are my picks for the 10 best uh, commons of all time. You know, really most of them are so good that they weren't great for the formats they were in. You know, that can be a thing that hurts a format, having too good of a common that the other colors can't keep up with. Um, and that's something that we're definitely seeing uh, here and to some extent we're seeing in Streets of New Capenna in general. Um, so yeah, that does it for this edition of Need to Know. It's I think next week, I'm recording, recording this earlier in the week, but I think by next week, we'll finally get to start talking about mechanics in Baldur's Gate Alchemy Horizons. Um, I'm hopeful we do anyway. They'll show us some cards from it and it'll be interesting to look at the set. And I'll probably do a video in the video about Alchemy Horizons, about alchemy and how I feel about it for limited and stuff like that. So if you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on all the past editions of Neats and Notes, and there's a lot of them at this point, you should see the playlist on your screen shortly. And lastly, if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the channel, there are lots of ways you can do that in the description. You can buy some Neats of Hone merch. Uh, you can become a channel member. You can... Uh, become a patron. There's lots of things you can find in the description if you want to go that extra mile. So check that out. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you all next time.